Hello and welcome to PC Mag Live. I'm Dan Costa, he is Sasha Segan, and we have a great show for you here from our studio and labs here in New York City. We're going to cover the latest news, we're going to pull one cool thing off the shelf in the lab, and we're going to answer some reader questions. We've got a great show for you today. Let's start with the strange thing that is in San Francisco Harbor. We think it's a boat, a Google boat perhaps, a Google barge. No one really knows what it is, but there is a large a structure that is being built in San Francisco Harbor. Everybody's speculating about what it might be. I think it's, I, it, that it could be a data center. It could be a Google Glass retail store. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't understand the whole Google Glass retail store thing. A while ago, as our compatriots at geek.com figured sure. out, uh, Google had a patent application for a seagoing data center. And now you think, is this crazy? And then you think, no, because data centers are these incredibly hot things full of computers generating heat. Now, anyone who's ever built a computer knows that one great way to dissipate heat is through water cooling. OK, where, where would you get the most water cooling of all? El, el mas water cooling. OK, think, you put it in the ocean. I think, it, I mean, it, it, there, there's no, con, the, Google won't, hasn't commented on what exactly this is. I don't even know how we know that Google is the one that's actually building it. Um, but there are lots of rumors. The structure is there. All the local news reporters are heading down there today to start asking questions and trying to figure it out. So if it is a marketing stunt, it's a pretty effective one. And if it's actually a new way of doing data centers, that is actually awesome. Because not only is it ocean cooled, but uh, I think the patent application had something to do with tidal power, mm -hmm. which is this uh, very eco-friendly, very green way of extracting energy just from the tides. Uh, if you can start powering data centers with this, we can really take some power off our strained American power grid. Yeah, I just love that there's something cool, technological, and unusual going on, so everyone assumes that Google's the one behind it. It's either Google or Elon Musk. It's, it's one or the other. Also in the news today, we've seen a plethora. We, asked, we got questions last week about where are the new Nexus rumors, what's going on. We've got more than rumors right now. We've got what we think are photos of the Nexus 5. Uh, the courtesy of EvLeaks, those look pretty accurate and pretty real. Hope, but we still don't know when this device is going to get launched or when it's going to be available for sale. Yeah, what's getting pretty funny is, okay, so we have the Nexus 5 leaks. Now we have Nexus 10 leaks, and uh, that's of a tablet that is slimmer than last year's Nexus 10. Same 2560 by 1600 screen and a Snapdragon 800 processor, so hopefully it won't drag like last year's tablet. Um, so there's the Nexus 5 leaks, there's the Nexus 10 leaks. The KitKat Twitter account keeps tweeting out that KitKat is coming soon. Um, Evan Blast now says that uh, the, the st this stuff will all come out on Friday, November 1st. Not coincidentally, the day the iPad goes on sale. But this is the fourth launch date we've heard. We heard October 15th, we heard October 28th, we heard October 31st, now we're hearing November 1st. What is up, Google? Yeah. And it also doesn't give the media a lot of time to prepare, not a lot of time for reviews, not a lot of time to build up marketing buzz. And you kind of wonder whether going the same day as the iPad is, I mean, that, that could work out to be very beneficial, but there's, I mean, iPad is going to own Friday. And I don't know that you want to, I don't know that I'd want to come to market with an iPad competitor on the same day that Apple's launching their, you know, industry-leading iPad. Especially when you can come out uh, two days before or two days after and then yeah. own the cycle then. I mean, if the iPad comes out on Friday, bring out your Nexus stuff on Monday. Steal the march from them. Have the iPad be old news by next Monday. Yeah, and this is, it does show how, you know, Apple's announcements, they don't, we don't get their dates early enough, and all the whole industry has to schedule their launches around Apple's launches. Uh, maybe Gabe, uh, Google's sort of figuring out what the best way to launch right now would be. Also in the news, this was an interesting story. We've had the Galaxy Gear on air on PC Mag Live. We reviewed it. We didn't love it. Turns out a lot of other people aren't necessarily loving it either. There's data out now saying that out of all the Galaxy Gears purchased at Best Buy, 30% of them have been returned. That's a pretty high return rate. And it doesn't bode well for this, you know, admittedly, first generation. The device. Galaxy Gear is a classic example of overpromising because it promises something and delivers nothing. Um, it, if you go look <laughs> that is, at. That is overpromising. Yes. If you go look at this great Galaxy Gear TV ad, they have this amazing TV ad where they basically show the Galaxy Gear as this the culmination of the evolution of all of these smartwatch dreams throughout the ages. And so somebody sees this ad and they go out and they say, I need to have one of these. And the first thing that happens not, is... Not knowing what it does right, or what they're right. going to use it for. The first thing that happens okay. is uh, they find it doesn't work with their phone. Though Samsung is slowly fixing this. They just announced today it'll uh, be soon be compatible with the S4, the Note 2, and the S3. Okay, great. 
But even if it was compatible with their phone, they find that it has kind of a clunky user interface, and it doesn't really do much, and you have to recharge it every day, and all the stuff that Jamie found in his review of the Galaxy Gear for our website where he decided not to recommend it. And so it goes back. I mean, I, I, I think this product was just released way too early. I, I've heard that Samsung is already getting the Galaxy Gear 2 ready for next year, and that is probably the one that should have come out. Yeah, I think there's lots of room for improvement here, obviously. I think I don't I don't I don't begrudge Samsung anything for coming out with this device. I think that they they got to the market early. They're establishing what the expectations are. They're taking a little bit of a hit now. Uh, we really like the Pebble smartwatch. If you really want to get a smartwatch and you really like that form factor, that's the best thing we've seen here in the lab. Um, it'll get better. Version two will be better. But right now there are a lot of lines to return them. So that's kind of unfortunate. Let's move on to a reader question. We get lots of reader questions over lots of media. This question from Heather actually came in by email. She wants to know, and it's a pretty basic question we used to answer all the time, what is the best phone for making voice calls in terms of both voice quality and loudness? Now, I don't use my phone to make voice calls unless I absolutely have to, and um, I'm, I'm all about the texting, but this is still an important feature for most people, for a lot of people. Yeah, and the number of non-smartphones out there that really focus on voice has been dwindling throughout the years. We still review them, but there's only a couple of them that come out every year. But that said, so we do test voice quality on all of our phone reviews, and we found that the Samsung Galaxy S4 is right now the best phone in terms of voice quality. Galaxy S4 is the one to go to if you want the sharpest possible calls on pretty much any network. Now, it does have kind of a complicated interface, but it has this great thing called Easy Mode that you can kick it into, and the interface becomes very simplified, and you have a simple but powerful smartphone that makes great calls. If you're looking purely for speakerphone volume, what you want is the S4 Active. This is a different phone than the S4. It's on AT&T, only AT&T, and has this really pumped up speakerphone. Now, it sounds like um, Samsung got rid of some of the noise cancellation in exchange for the speakerphone quality, so the S4 is better for voice calls all around, but if you just want total speakerphone domination, the S4 Active is the way to go. Yeah, also, one of the reasons why the S4, um, the original S4, has done so well in our tests and is our, our recommendation for a smartphone on almost every carrier is because in addition to offering lots of features, in, a different, in addition to offering a great uh, software feature set, it's also a really good phone. And that's, what's, that's helping it distinguish itself as well. So yeah, definitely check out the S4, the Active if you want, the speakerphone. It's time for one cool thing. We, uh, and I, we pulled one cool thing off the shelf today, and I said, wait, this looks like the NVIDIA Shield. We've already tested that ages ago. What is new about this? Well, this is a perfect example of how you can take something old and uh, make it new again with software. <coughs> this update, a huge software update, just came out for the NVIDIA Shield, which is NVIDIA's $299 uh, portable Android-based gaming device. Here, why don't you hold it? Yeah, uh, I'll do, I'll do the close-up here. some of the important things in this update, possibly the biggest, is something called Gamepad Mapper. The Shield had problems with a lot of Android games because they weren't designed to work with the Shield's uh, gaming controls. But this thing, Gamepad Mapper, it's a new piece of software that lets you map all the gaming controls and buttons to touchscreen actions. So suddenly you can play thousands of more Android games on this really well. Now there's also a console mode which makes the Shield work much better when it's hooked up to an HD TV. So uh, now you add a Bluetooth, you can add a Bluetooth controller and you can play these Android games really nicely on a TV. So the Shield is growing, it's developing, uh, it's becoming the Android gaming device that it, it really dreamed of being or that Nvid NVIDIA dreamed of it being. I mean, the big downside is still that it's $300 for a dedicated gaming device and that's still a lot. I mean, it's, the, the way I look at this, this is literally what you're paying for is not so much the platform, you're paying for the controller. Yeah. You're paying for something that's easier to, to hold in your hand than your phone. You can play all these same games on your phone. They can, will play almost as well, pretty much as well. Yeah, but you're, you're paying for these analog sticks and these buttons, and so this new Gamepad Mapper software, which just came out today, allows you to use this controller, which, as Dan says, it's what you're paying for with almost all the Android games. I would rather have this than, than Nintendo. I mean, this is, the, this is the most exciting portable gaming play, uh, device I, I know of. This is what I would buy if I wanted to buy this, uh, a platform like that. We're going to get a review of this up on the site on PC Mag. 
as soon as possible. Um, I think it's going to do well, but it's too early to tell. I'm not going to do the testing, and I want to promise. But um, very exciting. That was one cool thing. And that was PC Mag Live for today. We're going to be back on air at 12.30 tomorrow, 9.30 Pacific. Tune in. In the meantime, if you have questions, send them to us by email. Send them to us on Twitter. Share us on Facebook. I'm trying to really push our face- Facebook shares. So definitely share the show on Facebook. And tune in tomorrow. We will be live then. Sasha, thanks for joining us.